Hi, so this is Trojan Model Hubs, hacking the ML supply chain and defending yourself from threats. I'm Sam Washko, and with me presenting is Will Armiros. We're senior software engineers at Protect AI. And so for an agenda, we're going to go over public model registries and how those are vulnerable to threats like model serialization attacks. Then we're going to give an intro to the open source tool model scan and then talk about the different risks that come with private model registries and how to use zero trust architecture and apply that to machine learning. So to start with public model registries, uh, y'all know about Hugging Face? Sorry, not that Hugging Face. The Hugging Face that's relevant today is the public model hub Hugging Face. Because as you might know, AI is becoming increasingly democratized. There's been an evolution in the past couple of years going from creating models entirely from scratch to relying on these public foundation models. Because as these models get larger, more complex, some of the um, LLMs can have trillions of parameters, it becomes very time and resource intensive to train them entirely from scratch. So it ends up being where one organization trains one of these large foundation models on more generalized data, and then another organization will take that off of a model hub, hugging face being one of the, the most common, and fine tune it, so train it again with more specific data to the situation. And that's what ends up going into deployment. And this leads to a very open nature and community attitude on these sites, because everyone's iterating together, developing the models, making them better, and it leads to an implicit trust in the models that come from these platforms, which leads us, leaves us open to model serialization attacks. Because when it comes down to it, when model files are loaded, they execute code. Because to save a model to a file, you need to serialize it. So convert it from that artifact into a character stream that can be saved. And for a model file, that's going to consist of the tensors, so the large arrays of the weights of each layer, and the model architecture code, which says how to put it about all back together. And that serialized code needs to include the information to re reconstruct the model. And that means that code is executed on deserialization when you go to unpack it back into the artifact. So an attacker can inject malicious code into that file, and that's just executed automatically when you deserialize. The attacker doesn't need to do anything additional, it just will execute automatically. And it might not affect the model performance or the output, so the user might not know that anything is happening, but the attack is executing. This is a visualization of the serialization and deserialization process, going from the model to the byte stream, up to the artifact store, which might be something like Hugging Face, and back into the byte stream and model. And if a model serialization attack occurs, code is injected into that byte stream, either before it hits the artifact store or if the artifact store itself is compromised. And then when you go to deserialize into the model, we have arbitrary code execution, meaning the attacker can do any number of things from stealing credentials or sensitive data, poisoning other models and data sets, open a back, opening a back door they can use later. It's, it's really become the modern version of the Trojan horse, where we all remember the Trojan horse viruses from the early internet days, where you think you're doing downloading a program that does one thing, but it ends up running other background processes on your machine. It's similar to that, where you might not know, just using the machine learning model, that this has occurred. And classic antivirus software like ClamAV doesn't currently catch model serialization attacks because it's in the serialized code. 
So if it were deserialized, they might be able to catch it, but by that point, you're already vulnerable to the attack. And the pickle format is particularly vulnerable to this. Pickle is the Python native serialization format. So by, by design, it can include any arbitrary Python code. And it's been known to be unsafe for a while to open pickles because they can execute code. Uh, in 2021, Fickling uh, was a library that demonstrated model serialization attacks on pickle, and they made a pretty famous blog post about it. But many machine learning formats still use pickle under the hood. So certainly the classic libraries like scikit-learn and xgboost, but notably PyTorch, which is a very prolific machine learning framework, uses pickle under the hood. And pickle's not the only one that is vulnerable to this. Uh, some modern ones that don't use pickle, like Keras and TensorFlow, are still vulnerable. And this isn't purely a theoretical risk. We've done a sweep of hugging face and found over 3,000 models capable of uh, arbitrary code execution. And 41% of these were not detected by Hugging Face's current scans. They scan models using Pickle Scan, which is a basic um, serialization attack detector for pickles and ClamAV antivirus, but this misses a lot. So um, Hugging Face has said that it's kind of out of scope for them to check because they just have a large body of models on their platform and it's very easy for users to just share whatever they want. So it's up to the user to determine uh, how, to, how to check for these attacks. And one way to do it is model scan, which is an open source tool that's freely available through PIP or cloning on GitHub, and it detects model serialization attacks. Um, it scans for these malicious operators without needing to deserialize the file and become vulnerable to the attack. It supports all of the pickle-derived formats, including PyTorch, and most of the other major model formats, the, the ones that are at risk to, of this. So this is an overview of the approach we're taking for each type of file format. For pickle-based ones, we're going to be scanning through the opcodes and kind of reconstructing the stack of what operators would be executing on load and looking for any that would execute remote code like exec, eval, run pi, or things that touch the operating system like OS. And uh, TensorFlow, we're going to look for custom operators like read file and write file. Uh, for Keras models, we're gonna detect Lambda layers that can contain arbitrary code. So now we have this tool and you might be wondering when it would be useful to use it. A good heuristic is anytime the model is changing hands. So anytime you're using a pre-trained model from a different source, uh, like those foundation models on Hugging Face, that's a major time when you should be scanning because if you didn't generate it, you don't know what's in it. Another uh, time when it would be useful is when you're publishing to the model registry. So when it's changing hands from a training process into your registry, scan it before you're publishing to know that it's good and nothing was introduced. And another time that would be useful is scanning before deployment. So if you're putting it out for users to interact with or other parts of your organization to interact with, knowing that there's not gonna be anything they're at risk at if they go to load the model. So this is just a sample output for model scan. It's very easy to use both as a Python SDK and as a CLI tool. You just pass it the file path. And by default, it gives you this console human readable format, uh, listing the issues found and ranking them by severity. This is an example of one where it found a Lambda layer that includes arbitrary code in um, a Keras file. 
So it's, yeah, by, by default, it's this console format, but it's also possible to use JSON or to modify the tool to have a custom reporting format for whatever you need or to update scanners or add your own scanners. It's very configurable through a settings file to be able to easily be used within like a CI CD workflow to automatically scan models. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Will to talk about the further risks with private model registries. Thanks, Sam. So now we're going to talk about some of the risks with private model registries. So in contrast to the public model registries that Sam was talking about, where the idea is to share your models in an open source and public manner so that the community can learn and use those models, a private model registry is meant to store proprietary or private models, which are usually trained on either PII data or are simply seen as some sort of competitive advantage where the organization that created these models do not want, does not want anyone else to access them. So there's a variety of private model registries on the market today, including uh, MLflow, which is a very popular open source registry that companies can download for free and deploy within their organization. And then there's several commercial offerings like weights and biases. There are model registries from all of the major cloud providers like SageMaker model registry. And then lastly, you could always just forego all the nice features of a model registry and dump your private models into cloud storage like an S3 bucket. So all of these options for private model registries are safe, right? We know that the access to the models within them are limited to our internal teams only. And hopefully everyone in our organization is, is getting compensated well enough so that we are not introducing these model serialization attacks. And uh, our company has a security team that might be regulating these repositories and making sure that everything is safe. Well, of course, this wouldn't be a very long talk if all those were the case. So let's go ahead and challenge some of these assumptions. To start, Protect AI's threat research community, Hunter, has found over 20 security vulnerabilities in that open source MLflow package in the last year alone. And a significant number of these allowed for complete system takeover of the MLflow server. So in other words, an attacker that's exploiting one of these vulnerabilities would be able to steal any of the models within this registry and even overwrite them and replace them with other uh, potentially tainted files. And if you were part of the group that stores their models in S3 buckets or some other cloud storage, we found that up to 46% of these S3 buckets can have misconfigured permissions which allow for additional people to access their contents that were not initially intended. Meaning once again, that some adversaries could potentially be able to read or even write to these model files that are being stored in your private storage. And so these should prime the need for something that we call zero trust architecture, which is uh, basically an idea of treating every single system in your machine learning development cycle as an external system that cannot be trusted implicitly. So to understand the need of, of why you might want to apply zero trust architecture to some of your machine learning practices, we can consider some pretty scary hypotheticals. So to start, what would happen if a malicious actor gained access to your systems? So for instance, those private model registries that we talked about. Well, it would be a free for all, right? We could no longer trust any of these models because they could potentially be infiltrated by an attacker and have some uh, new exploits inserted into them. And so that, of course, begs the question of how do you know that an existing model within your uh, private model registries doesn't have any of these uh, model serialization attacks or other vulnerabilities? 
So this is a bit of a trick question because we know that we can scan it with model scan. And so it's really important that you scan not only your public models that you're downloading from uh, registries like Hugging Face, but also scanning your private and internal models to make sure that they haven't been compromised. But there is actually another possibility that an attacker could do as well. An attacker, instead of injecting a model serialization attack, could do what's known as a model poisoning attack. And for an example, uh, an attacker, if you had a model that was trained to identify images of street signs, so for instance, it could classify stop signs and speed limit signs and things like that, if an attacker got access to that model, then they could actually fine tune it with only a few additional training samples of, for example, a pictures of a stop sign with a blue sticker on it. And they could then fine tune your model to classify those examples as instead of a stop sign, as speed limit signs that are 80 mile per hour speed limit signs. And so because they were able to infiltrate your model and, and fine tune it with these few examples, your model would now consider any stop sign that it saw in the real world with a blue sticker on it to not be a stop sign, but instead be an 80 mile per hour speed limit sign, which you could imagine the implications for that could be pretty dire. And so this is an example of a model poisoning attack, which model scan can't necessarily detect because it only involves a small changing of the weights of your model rather than injecting a complete model serialization attack. So that begs the question of how do you know that that model hasn't been tampered with at whatsoever while it's been sitting in storage? And so that's what we're gonna to try to find out. The technique that we're going to use to make sure that a model can't be tampered with is called cryptographic signing and verification. And it's a really foundational component of zero trust architectures. And it's been a common practice in traditional software development for quite a long time because of this. And what signing and verification does is it helps solve the problem of these untrusted software artifacts. Because with uh, cryptographic signing, a developer, the moment that they produce any artifact, such as a machine learning model, a trusted developer can create a signature for that new artifact, which basically ties their trusted identity to that artifact at that point in time. And then later on, any other party can then verify the signature of that artifact to make sure it's the same exact instance of that artifact that was created uh, by the developer that was the trusted entity initially. So you don't need any implicit trust because you can actually rely on this provable verification from the signature created by the developer. And so the tool that we recommend using to implement the signing and verification process is called SIGSTOR. So SIGSTOR is an open source project maintained by the Open Source Security Foundation or OpenSSF, and it provides tools for signing and verifying artifacts. Uh, specifically, it provides a cosign CLI that allows you to sign and verify any artifact. And the key innovation that SIGSTOR provides is that it allows developers to sign any artifact with their OIDC identity instead of using public-private key infrastructure, which can be quite complex. And so to see what I mean, we can go to this quick uh, demo that we have of cosign in action. So in this case, I wanted to sign a specific model that I had just trained and was storing in MLflow with my uh, personal identity. So we can see that I'm using the SIGSTOR cosign CLI and I'm uh, calling the sign blob command. And here it prompts me to log in with an identity provider. And then I can actually log in with Google to verify my identity. And that is all that I need to do for SIGSTOR to actually create the signature for this model. And then later on, whenever any third party wants to verify the signature and verify that this model is the exact same one 
that I, as a trusted developer, had created, then all that they need to do is pass in my email address, which is public information, to make sure that this is the same exact model that I created. And then they also need to pass in the uh, identity provider, which in this case is uh, google.com. And so what we see here is that Cosign allows this verification process to succeed. Um, once you pass in all this information for the given machine learning model. So we can see that it successfully verifies. So we saw that uh, Cosign can sign any sort of artifact. So let's see how it actually works in practice with uh, this traditional software case. So if we wanted to apply this uh, safe deployment practice to uh, something like containers, then this is the kind of workflow that we would want to follow. And this is the workflow that's being followed in practice in a lot of traditional software development life cycles. So to start, uh, we would write some source code and build a container image out of that source code uh, that could be, you know, then deployed later on, whether it's an API service or some other backend system, um, we would start by just actually writing the code for it. And then as a good security-minded engineer, the second thing that we would do is we would always scan that container image with a traditional antivirus software, such as ClamAV, to make sure that there are no dependencies or other concerning vulnerabilities within that container image we just created. And so next we would use Cosign, uh, just like we saw in that demonstration, to actually sign that container image with the developer's identity and create a signature for it, which would then get uploaded to a container registry such as Docker Hub, uh, along with the image that we created for future use. So then later on, whenever any other developer wants to pull down this container image to use for themselves, they can verify that signature that we had created to make sure that it's the exact same container image that was initially pushed up by their trusted developer. And assuming that that verification succeeds, they can go ahead with their deployment. So this is the workflow that exists in practice today with a lot of traditional software development environments. So now we're gonna see how we can apply the same process to machine learning model development processes. So we can see here, there's a lot of overlap between uh, some of the traditional software processes, processes and the machine learning uh, processes. And so we can actually uh, see each of these step-by-step step how they correspond to that uh, traditional software lifecycle we just saw. So again, here's that traditional software lifecycle. And here's what we're gonna do for our machine learning model workflow. So we start instead of uh, by writing source code for a machine learning model workflow, we're going to start by training a few examples of our model. And so we'll start by, you know, maybe tuning some hyperparameters and doing whatever else we need to make sure that our model satisfies all the criteria that we set for it. Once we're happy with our model, we can serialize it into a file. And the first thing that we wanna do as we learned from Sam is that we wanna scan it with model scan to make sure that no third-party dependencies introduced any model serialization attacks. If model scan gives it a clean bill of health, then we know that it's ready for us to sign it with cosine. And so much like we did for the container image, we can sign this model artifact with our identity to give it our sort of seal of approval that this model is safe and ready to use before we upload it to a model registry such as MLflow. And at this point, we don't actually really need to worry about MLflow being uh, infiltrated or this model being replaced with a malicious version because we know that whenever anybody pulls this model down later on to deploy it, they will always verify the signature that we initially attached to it and make sure that the signature matches um, the one I initially gave to it. 
And as long as that's the case, then they can run it as absolutely a trusted model with no model poisoning attacks and no uh, model serialization attacks because of the scanning that we've done on it. And if that wasn't the case, and if it had been tampered with, then this verification step would fail and we would know not to proceed with it. But if it succeeds, then we can safely deploy this model for use in inference. So we covered a lot of ground in this talk, but the three main takeaways that we want to make sure everyone walks away with are that first, uh, model files can always be vulnerable to model serialization attacks. And that is why, um, second, you should always scan your models with model scan to detect these MSAs whenever they might be present. And then lastly, especially when dealing with private models, you should always sign your models with SIGStore and verify them when using them to establish their authenticity and integrity. So thank you so much for listening to this talk and please feel free to check out the open source model scan project and connect with Sam or myself on LinkedIn to discuss this further. Mm -hmm.